To the left hand side for Vieira, who will play it through to Gabriel Jesus, who's in here for Arsenal. Gabriel Jesus to finish it off. Oh, what a way to do it! Gabriel Jesus seals the points for Arsenal. He's back and he's back with a bang. Into the penalty area it goes. Gabriel Keller and it's into the back of the net. Arsenal take an early lead through Gabriel. You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna, the daily Arsenal podcast with me, Harry Simeon. Hey everybody, how's it going? Hope you're all good. Hope you're all well. Welcome back to another episode of the Chronicles of a Guna podcast. If you're watching us on YouTube, I'm sorry about the lights. Um, I'm in a podcast booth with all these fancy LED lights and I have no idea how to change the color. And when I did change the color to a color that brightened up the room and looked really good on the camera, um, it then started flashing. And then I didn't know how to stop it flashing. And I've had a whole palaver trying to get the lights to look semi-decent. Um, in the end, I just decided, you know what? Time's running out. Need to get on with this. So I pressed record. So sorry about the visual. It's not as good as it normally is, but the content will be, I promise you. We've got quite a bit to get into today. We're going to talk about Arsenal's priority this summer. As per the Athletic, we're going to talk about a midfielder who currently plays in French football that Arsenal are being linked with, and we're going to discuss the latest on Bologna's Joshua Xerxes. Could he be headed to another Premier League club? We'll do all of that. We'll reflect a little bit on yesterday's Euro 2024 action as well. You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna. Don't go anywhere. I have to say, when I woke up on Tuesday morning and realized that there was, well, I knew from before, but it kind of dawned on me and hit me that there was no 2 p.m. game. I was annoyed. I was frustrated. I was working from home and I thought, what better than to have a day working from home where you just literally um, take in a, a shit ton of football, chat a little bit about it. It's like the dream day, right? But there wasn't a 2 p.m. game. And then I looked at the Turkey-Georgia fixture and I thought, you know, Turkey playing in Germany, the country where there's the biggest population of Turkish people outside of Turkey, from what I understand, there's bound to be a good atmosphere. But can Georgia actually compete? I watched Georgia against Greece in the playoff. And although Georgia went through in the end on penalties, they weren't particularly great that day. Like I didn't look at them and think, you know, they're a match for Turkey at these Euros. So I had little expectations around that game, but I can tell you this, that was the best game of Euro 2024 so far. I don't think I've enjoyed another match more than that. And it made up for the fact that there was no 2 p.m. kickoff. The fact that 5 p.m. Turkey versus Georgia was a literal festival of football. I thought it was amazing. The atmosphere was incredible. The goals were stunning. Um, there was drama at the end. There was just so much to like about it. And although I moan about the format and I moan about the fact that the group stages have as many teams in as they do and that the best three third place teams, uh, four, I beg your pardon, third place teams go through. That's not right, et cetera, et cetera. You wouldn't get the stories that Georgia bring, that Romania brought the day before, um, if you didn't have uh, this expanded competition. And you don't get these teams making the finals if you don't have the qualifying campaigns and the Nations League that we all sit here and moan about over and over again. I love international football on the tournament stage. Maybe we could do something about how we get to that phase and, and how the qualifiers work. But... I don't know. I just, I've really enjoyed the Euro so far, like really a lot. And I can't wait to get stuck into today's football as well. But of course, we are going to talk Arsenal here. Um, we are going, let me just ask you a quick question before I dive into the Arsenal chat. Did anyone else like me feel a little bit bitter when Portugal scored the winner against Czechia last night because it was Conceição's son and because of the the way he sort of conducted himself during the Champions League tie between us and Porto. Did anyone else feel that or was it just me? Because I really did feel that. Um, when I realised it was him that scored, I was kind of like, oh, whatever, move on. But anyway, let me know your thoughts in the comments. Don't forget to leave a like on the video, by the way, if you're uh, watching us on YouTube, if you're listening on audio, remember to leave us a review as well. That really, really does help. But now let's jump into those Arsenal-related stories. 
Let's begin with uh, a report from The Athletic in which it was revealed that Arsenal's new priority this window, after, of course, seemingly missing out on Benjamin Sesko, is a midfielder. According to Gunnerblog, who penned this piece, the club prefer a number six to a number eight, as they believe that position has the best options in the market, which would suggest that Declan Rice obviously capable of dropping into that sixth position. And that is the position where I probably think he's best, but is going to play a little bit further forward. And Arsenal have assessed their options in both areas and have decided that actually there's more scope to go out and bring in a top number six than there is to go out and bring a top number eight. Declan Rice has done quite well in that number eight position. And so we're going to focus our efforts there. I saw this piece of information, by the way, I beg your pardon, I've got a really sore throat today. I saw this piece of information um, being credited to David Ornstein. David Ornstein replied to one of the posts that had credited it, credited it to him. I beg your pardon, and, and made the point that it was Gunner Blog's information, which it is. Uh, so shout out to him, of course, for the scoop. But it looks like Arsenal are uh, going to move for a midfielder above everything else, and I think that's right. By my estimations, by my calculations, that is the position that needs the most work this summer particularly if there's a chance that we're going to lose Thomas Partey. We don't know that that's going to happen, but we heard last week that there was a lot of interest from Saudi Arabia in particular. Now, it remains to be seen whether or not Thomas Partey would be interested in a move over there. But I think if the right money's on offer, Arsenal might consider it. Personally, I think it's going to you know, be one of those things where, yeah, you know what, the money's attractive, but perhaps what's more attractive would be getting his wages off of the bill. Um, because I just think about it and I look at it. And if you got, what, 15, 20 million tops from the Saudis for Thomas Partey, is that worth what you're losing? Because if a Thomas Partey that is managed over the course of next season can contribute in some way, I would argue that his contribution would be worth more to us than a measly 15 to 20 million pounds in today's market, in which case you just let him go on a free at the end of next year. You assess him, you think about whether you want to give him a short-term extension or you just want to move him on. But I think our midfield plans um, will be centred around two things, where Declan Rice is going to play. And if Arsenal think that bringing in a six is the priority, although that might be because they believe the market for sixes is better and more healthy at this moment in time, it will be partly to do with where they see Declan Rice playing moving forward as well. Although I don't think Rice is super suited to playing in those more advanced positions against certain teams. I do think when he's in there alongside a, a more sort of defensive minded midfield player and the fact that Rice can do a bit of both does balance us out a bit better and it balances us out in a similar way to the way we saw when Granit Xhaka was playing with Partey and Odegaard because Xhaka could give you a bit of both. I know people always argued that he couldn't do the defensive midfield side, but he had those instincts. He had um, the awareness, the positional awareness of where he needed to be to fill in and to help out. And he was incredibly hard working. And I think you could say a lot of that for Declan Rice as well. So we'll see what happens, but it looks like midfield is where Arsenal's focus is at the moment. On the subject of midfielders, then Ben Jacobs has claimed that both Arsenal and AC Milan are tracking the Monaco midfielder, Yusuf Fofana. It goes on to say uh, in his report that the 25-year-old is expected to leave Monaco this summer with a deal likely for over £15 million. Now, we read maybe two or three weeks ago now that Monaco uh, were keen to move Fofana on because he is going into the last year of his contract and so they'd rather get something than nothing. Uh, we've heard lots and lots of glowing reviews about Yusuf Fofana and I can tell you now that the next scouting report episode we do will be on Yusuf Fafana. We'll give you the lowdown on him. We'll give you the breakdown on him and you can decide uh, whether or not you think he'd be a good signing. We also read that Monaco were looking for 20 to 25 million euros, which kind of does fall in line with this figure that's been reported. If you do the conversion, 20 million euros is probably about 15 million pounds, give or take a little bit. So yeah, that all makes sense. Yusuf Fafana... I think from the limited sort of time I've seen him play, looks a lot more well-rounded than, for example, 
Amadou Anana, who we did a scouting report on yesterday. The link is in the description. Go back and check that out. Um, I know you guys have been enjoying the scouting report episodes. Um, I'm really enjoying putting them together and it's given me the kind of energy and, and enthusiasm, if you like, to go ahead and make more. So I'm going to do that. We'll bring you a Yusuf Fafana one uh, at some point over the coming days. But yeah, I, I think the eye test tells me that he's a bit more well-rounded uh, than Amadou Anana. And what my opinion of him and my impression of him going into the bit of research that I'm going to conduct over the next few days is that on the ball, he's far more accomplished. And I think that's a really key ingredient that we're looking for in whoever's going to come in and play a part or a part, I beg your pardon, in Arsenal's central midfield going forward. So Yusuf Fafana, Arsenal, have him on their radar. And I just think for a player of this calibre, I know he's 25, so he's a little bit older than what our sort of ideal um, profile of signing is. We always talk about this, Arsenal looking for sort of 22, 23 year olds that have got quite a bit of experience. Yusuf Afan is a little bit older than that, but at that price, I think that's that's fine. You know, we're not talking about going and spending north of 50 million pounds on a 25, 26 year old. We're talking about spending 15 million pounds sterling there or thereabout, which isn't actually that much money. So I'd certainly do my homework on this guy and I'd certainly be. Um, evaluating whether or not he'd be a good signing because at that price, it feels like a really, really good opportunity. You might do that evaluation if you're Arsenal Football Club and you might come to the conclusion that he's not quite at our level, that you prefer somebody else or you'd rather spend a bit more on somebody that you think um, ticks more of the boxes, I guess. But for me, just off the top of my head and based on the limited stuff I know about him, he feels like a better fit than Amadou Anana. But again, and I'll be able to answer that question a little bit better once I've done that bit of research and we've had a good look into him. But Arsenal, according to Ben Jacobs, do have an interest in the Monaco man. And I know, based on reading some of your posts over the last few days, that a lot of Arsenal fans will be quite excited to hear this. Okay, and our final story of the day is with regards to the Bologna striker, Joshua Zerksy. There's been a lot of umming and ahhing around whether or not Arsenal are going to turn their attentions to Joshua Zerksy because, of course, they missed out by the looks of it on Benjamin Sesko, who we understand the club had a concrete interest in. David Ornstein reported yesterday evening, uh, so Tuesday evening, that Manchester United are exploring a deal for the Bologna striker. The interest is advanced and dialogue with the striker's camp um, has taken place. Uh, the 23-year-old is among multiple options that United are looking at as a forward. No club-to-club -club talks yet, but United are considering uh, that approach and they're aware of the €40 million Euro buyout clause in his contract. Have we heard about the buyout clause, by the way, before? I've heard that there was one. I didn't really know the specifics of it. 40 million euros is not a lot of money. Um, it, it really isn't. Not for a player that I think has the potential of Joshua Xerxes. I've said before, I think on the ball, um, very exciting, very unpredictable in his movements, very intelligent, very, very, very sophisticated footballer. But my reservation has always been around Joshua Xerxes. If you're saying that we don't have a cold-blooded killer in front of goal, but you're also saying that Joshua Xerxes is the man for us, then that doesn't really marry up because he's brilliant in terms of his all-round game, but he is not that cold-blooded killer in front of goal. He's not going to come in and score you 25 to 30 goals over the course of the season. Not based on the evidence we've seen at Bologna anyway. So... That was always my kind of thing with this, is Arsenal fans going, well, we desperately need that goal scorer. But then with the same tone of voice saying, but Joshua Xerxes would be a good signing. Well, no, because that's not what Joshua Xerxes specialises in. To give you an idea of what Joshua Xerxes is like, he's a big old lad. He's quite gangly at times. And, you know, some people would argue that he looks a little bit awkward. He is a bit like a Kai Havertz in that he's not an out-and-out -out striker, but he can lead the line for you and he can bring others into the game. And if you've got really productive wide players, which we do, and you've got a really productive creative midfielder like Martin Odegaard, which again we do, then you could probably get quite a lot out of Joshua Zerksy and he would be a good asset. But he doesn't tick that one particular box of, you know, 
regular goal scorer in the sense of, if you look at what he scored in Serie A this season, um, you know, I think, let me check what it is exactly. I think off the top of my head, I want to say it's something like 14 goals, 15 goals, maybe. Um, 23 years old, the Dutchman. Let me just check that. Uh, Serie A, oh, it was 11 goals. It was even less than that. So 11 goals in Serie A isn't going to translate, in my opinion, to 20 goals in the Premier League. And that's what you have to be mindful of. You'd be bringing in another build-up player. You'd be bringing in um, another, you know, key player, but someone that I'm not sure addresses the problem that a lot of us believe Arsenal have at this moment in time. Interesting that Manchester United are looking into him. Obviously, Eric Ten Hag uh, is staying on at the club. We'll know a lot about um, players that have come out of the Netherlands. We'll probably be aware of Joshua Zerks' history. Everybody's been impressed with what he and Bologna as a team managed to achieve over the course of last season. Um, and so I'm not surprised that a big club like that is looking at him. 40 million euros, it probably feels uh, like a worthwhile gamble. Again, it's a bit like the Fofana thing where maybe he doesn't answer all of your questions. Maybe he doesn't provide a solution to each and every one of your issues. But at that price, he might be worth trying to do a deal for anyway. I think that's where Xerxes falls in terms of my uh, estimations of him and the need on or, or not need to do this deal. Um, but yeah, look, there's a release clause there. If Arsenal do want this guy, they're probably going to have to get a move on because Manchester United um, are, according to this, are considering making a formal approach to Bologna. They'll probably still do further research. They'll probably want to gauge from the player what his requirements would be. Um, there'd probably be conversations back and forth between Manchester United and Xerxes representatives for a while yet before we see anything move forward because we're in the Euros, we're in the group stage as well, which means there's so much football going on. There's so many players involved in the competition. Xerxes is out in Germany with the Netherlands side, was called up at the last minute to replace an injured player. Um, wasn't initially called up, which surprised a few people, but he's there now. And so you feel like, yep, this is Man United laying down their marker, but nothing is done yet. And if you want to do this, Arsenal, if you want to get involved in this, then you probably need um, to pull your finger out and move forward with it. Personally, from what I hear, from what I understand, and again, you know, I never claim to be the, the, the oracle of knowledge around what exactly Arsenal are doing behind the scenes. I don't believe Arsenal's interest is as strong as some of the supporters' interest in this player. And I think that can be said for Yusuf Fofana as well, in that, is he on Arsenal's radar? Yeah. It seems that he is, but is it really, really concrete interest? Is it at an advanced stage? Is it at a point where we're talking about offers going in and progress being made? I think Xerxes and Fafana fall in the same camp. Players that we're looking at and think, yeah, you know what? You'd be a decent sign-in. You'd be a good addition, but we're not there yet in terms of advancing and moving with these things. And Tom Canton reported yesterday that Arsenal aren't going to panic after sort of seemingly missing out on Benjamin Sesko. And they absolutely don't need to. They've got a very good, strong, competitive squad. I think they're going to move on some players between now and the end of the window. They will raise money from sales. And I think Arsenal will feel like they're in a really good, strong position. It's a really attractive club to be at right now. And um, and that puts them, you know, automatically above the likes of Man United if they were to go head-to-head -head with a club like that for a player like this. So, as long as Arsenal and Edu are keeping their ear to the ground and are aware of where this is at, how it's going, there's no reason why if Man United trigger that release clause, Arsenal can't go in and trigger it the next day um, and, and you know, move forward in their conversations with the player. So no need to panic, no need to stress. It's a signing I'd quite like in that I like Joshua Xerxes, but it's not a signing that I'm adamant is going to be a huge difference maker for us. So... I'm kind of meh. If it happens, it happens. I trust that Mikel Arteta's seen enough and Edu's seen enough that he can help us. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And we move on. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. Don't forget to leave a like on the video. It really, really does help. Subscribe to the pod as well. If you're listening on audio, that really, really does help. Leave us a review, please. And we'll be back on Thursday with another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna. Until then, take care of yourselves. Enjoy the football. Have a great day.